continue our stroll through the Bible and different portions here in Mark 12. We're in the week before Jesus is um, is 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 uh, crucified, and he's teaching regularly in the Temple Mount and explaining things, and so he becomes open to where people come and ask him questions. And so, after the first, last week we dealt with the sea taxes to Caesar, and well this week we come now to verse 18 of Mark chapter 12, and here we have the Sadducees coming and asking Jesus a question. Well, just as we have different political parties with different philosophical uh, beliefs and theological beliefs, so too the ancient Israelites or the Jews had. We're more familiar with the Pharisees, and it was because it was with the Pharisees that Jesus debated the most. And when we look at Jesus' debate with the Pharisees, what becomes very obvious, it's very rarely over doctrine. He pretty much agrees with them about doctrine. But when it comes to practice, there is a disagreement on how you live the holy life before God. And what is the proper way of being holy and expressing that holiness in this world before God? How does one maintain themselves pure and undefiled from the world? And so it's practice that Jesus is debating with them most of the time on. But here come the Pharisees, or the Sadducees, excuse me, the Sadducees. And the Sadducees are a different group of folks. They don't hold to all the doctrines of the Jews. In fact, they, they're, they're aristocrats. In fact, what's kind of the odd thing is they're the priestly circles. It's kind of like in the United Methodist Church right now, you have a lot of the lay people who are affirming the traditional plan and a lot of the ministers and the bishops wanting to go a different route. And there's this complete division between the two. And so the, the, the Sadducees, you know, they, they, they were upper class and they enjoyed the luxuries of life and they wanted to be Jews, but they didn't want to have their Judaism to infringe upon their lifestyles and their interaction with the world elite. And so they limited how scripture affected them. And they would only take things that were explicitly taught in scripture as requirements. In other words, uh, if they were around today, they would be the ones arguing, well, the Bible doesn't say thou shalt not abort children. Therefore, abortion must be okay. They would say, well, the Bible doesn't explicitly, or Jesus doesn't explicitly say, and therefore, therefore it's okay. And so they would just kind of go and play that type of game with the people. And so anyways, in verse 18, we've had the Sadducees. And it says this, And the Sadducees came to him, who say there is no resurrection. And they asked him a question. The very first thing they come up to him is they ask him a question about the resurrection. They ask him a doctrinal question. And it's very interesting because in their theology, you, there was not an afterlife. There was not a coming kingdom. What you had in this life was what you had. And God rewarded those in this life for your good deeds. So if you were a good person, you lived a good and comfortable life. But if you sinned, you had an uncomfortable life. You received your reward in this life. Now you can see how that appeals to wealthy people because they have everything they need. So they would look around and say, see what God has provided for us? We, don't, we, we're, we can't be sinners. Look at all the wealth and good that God has given us. They would fit very well with the Joel Osteens of today and the many others where you have this life and prosperity. If you, if you have happy thoughts, you'll have a happy life. And that's the way they lived it. But they did not believe in the resurrection. So they came to Jesus with a question. In verse 19, now notice that these guys, when they came to Jesus, did not butter them up. The Pharisees came in the past, previous passage and they buttered Jesus up. These guys felt that they were superior 
to Jesus. So they had a trick question for him. And they said to him, Teacher, in verse 19, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife, but leaves no children, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now what this is here is the Leverite marriage. It's a custom that was regulated in the Old Testament. It wasn't necessarily a requirement, uh, but it was regulated in the Old Testament. We see this uh, event, this type of law taking place in the book of Ruth. And basically what it was, was a legal situation where if part of the family tr tree was going to be cut off, you would still raise children to that part of the family tree and that's, those children would receive the inheritance. You have to, well, inheritance of their father and continue the father's line. And that way family would not be diminished. But anyways, they said this, this scenario, you have... A wife and the son, the, the husband dies with none. And so they give up a scenario there in ver, beginning of verse 20. And it says this. There were seven brothers. The first took a wife and then he died and left no offspring. The second took her and died, leaving no offspring. The third likewise. And then the seven left no offspring. Last of all, the woman died. In the resurrection, is their question, what's going to happen? And so they have this scenario of seven brothers. All of them die. All of them have been married to the same woman, but haven't produced any children by her. And it's kind of interesting because this is similar to a scenario that is found in the Apocrypha in the book of Talbot, where you have this young girl who has a demon that uh, hovers over her. And everybody she marries dies on the wedding night. And she goes through six husbands that way. And so she's, you know, who knows? Maybe there's a, they're thinking about that, that, uh, that uh, Jewish legend. But the question is, you know, when we come to the end of this and we look at the question is simply this, whose wife is she in the resurrection? At the resurrection, whose wife? She's been married to all seven of them. So which one? is her real husband. Now when we look at this, we realize that they have a very pagan understanding of resurrection. It's kind of like that of the Egyptians, where they viewed that the life to come after this is merely a reflection of this life. That what goes on in the life after is merely a continuation of what went on in this life. But Jesus then answers them in verse 24 and says to them, and he hits them real hard. Is this not the reason that you are wrong? He just tells them flat out they're wrong. Because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. In your intellectualism, you don't know what the scriptures actually say. And you don't even know what the power of God can do. You don't understand what's going on. And then he just goes on and says, For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And what Jesus is basically telling, there's going to be a discontinuity between this life and what goes on in heaven. You know, we take those marriage vows, and if you notice in the marriage vow, we say, Until death do us part. Now, what, so that brings up the question is what is life or what is existence or life going to be like in the new age, in the new heavens? In some ways, we can go through scripture and we see that it is similar to today in that we will have bodies, physical bodies, like that of Christ. We're told that when he appears, we will be like him and that we will have a glorified body like his. And if you remember, that glorified body appeared to the disciples after the resurrection and the disciples were able to touch him physically and he was able to sit down and eat and enjoy physically. And so there will be a lot of things that are similar. And the other thing that's interesting about when, the, when he appeared to the disciples, the disciples recognized who he was. 
So that tells us that we will be able to physically see one another, physically hear and touch one another, physically sit down and enjoy a meal together, and even to be able to recognize one another. So certain aspects of the resurrection will be the same as here. But at the same time, we find that there are some interesting differences. If you go to Luke chapter 24, verse 36 through 43, you'll see where Jesus appears to the disciples. And notice what I said, appears. He's evidently, this body is beyond our physical body. It doesn't have the physical limitations that our current body has. In the sense that we, I just can't walk out of, I just can't walk through this wall or disappear unless I put some smoke up or do some type of magical trick and do all sorts of things. I can't do it. But we find that Jesus would appear and disappear. It's like he could step in from one dimension and step out into another dimension. It's, it's, you know, so we get the sense that these bodies are even greater than our current bodies. We're called, that's why we call them glorified bodies. In fact, these bodies will be able to enter into the presence, the heavenly presence of God, just as Jesus does after the resurrection. When he says, I have to go before my Father, he goes in his physical body. So this tells us that, you know, at death, we're told that, you know, the what basic death is the soul being separated from the body. Tells us that at some point, we will, re, be re, you know, we will be resurrected, our bodies will be resurrected, and we will be joined. And it will be something similar to what we have now, but at the same time, something greater. Now this always brings up the question, you know, you have a spouse that you've loved all your life and you've been with all your life, and you wonder, you know, is it going to be the same? Well, no, it's not going to be the same. I don't know exactly what it will be like, but I would imagine that the intimacy, the spiritual and emotional and intellectual intimacy will be much greater than anything that we've ever experienced on this earth. And that we will be able to um, go and go enjoy things in ways that we could never imagine, but the physical aspect of that relationship will no longer be necessary and my guess no longer needed or even functional. Because he says, like the angels. We find in 1 Corinthians this description of how the physical body, you know, that the incorruptible, the corrupted body, these bodies are corrupted, are laid aside, and we put on an incorruptible body. You know what that basically means? We don't have to worry about heart congestion, we won't have to worry about illness. Nothing will call, you know, we won't have to worry about Alzheimer's or any of these things. We'll be able to enjoy fellowship with people. And they will remember us in the presence of the Lord. Because we will be like Christ. We know that in scriptures in 2 Peter 3, 11 through 13, it tells us that this world will be destroyed under fire and done away with, and a new world will arise. I don't know exactly how God's going to do it. Uh, you know, he may take this world and melt it down and reform a new world. Who knows how God is going to do it? But we will be able to live and enjoy a rest, something even greater than what the Garden of Eden was in this life. If you have farm, you may, we may do, you know, if you enjoy your gardens, you, we may have gardens to do. We may have, to, who knows what God has for us. And we'll have eternity to do it in. It's not merely praising and singing him to him. But when we look at the scriptures, this is one area of the scriptures. The scriptures tells us God, you know, he doesn't give us all the details of how it's going to work out. But we do know that in God, there is eternal life. And we see that here in Mark chapter 12, because Jesus goes and when he turns on the Sadducees, doctrinally, the Sadducees played a little a hermeneutic game. And their hermeneutic was simply this, if it wasn't explicitly said, it wasn't true. If it didn't explicitly say it there, it was not there. 
And if it wasn't woodenly literal, it wasn't there. They held to a, a little, uh, uh, they played a game with scriptures because their intent was to keep it from claiming their lives. But Jesus goes to and says in verse 26, As for the dead being raised, you have not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the burning bush, how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are quite wrong. He plays a game. He plays by their own rules. And notice what God says, I am the God. Well, if there was no life after death, God would have said, I was the God. Because at this point in time, they had been buried. And so we wonder, what is eternal life? Eternal life actually begins today by knowing God. If you know God, if you know the Son, you have eternal life. And though we may die, we live. Because we are connected, we are dwelling in the God of life who preserves our life, who restores our life, and who even gives us more than what our lives had. So unlike the world, when they die, they lose it all. We as Christians, when we pass away, when God calls for us to come before him, we may give up what we have on this earth, but we go and receive from him what he has prepared for us. It's kind of like a child. He has a little matchbox car and he enjoys, I remember having matchbox cars and playing with them and enjoying them. And then you then you graduate and you have the, the model cars that you used to make. Remember those? And then if you were really, uh, well, you might get some metal cars. I only had metal, the metal, uh, the tanks and all that type of stuff. But then there comes an age where you graduate and if your parents are wealthy enough, they do what? They give you a car. Or you get to go do a job, and then one day you go and buy a car. That car is much greater than the toys that you had before. And this is what we have to understand about the resurrection. What we have on this life can be good, and much of it is good and enjoyable. But we also have to remember that God, that Christ has gone and prepared a place for us, that God has promised us resurrection, and that this resurrected body, this resurrected life, is not a life that is uh, just a mere reflection of this life. It is something greater. It is something that our, we can't even imagine the beauty and the greatness in it. Yes, we may lose certain aspects. We may lose what we have on this earth. After all, it's subject to moths and rust, decay and abuse. And then when we're gone, we have no control of what our inheritors do with it. But then, but, but, in, but with God, we will have something that's imperishable, glorious, something greater than anything we can imagine. And that is what he promises us throughout the scriptures. And he promises that and he hints at it all the way back at the beginning when he made the garden a pristine place for humanity to grow up in. And he has also created that he's created the new heavens and the new earth a pristine place, a glorified place where we can enjoy our relationships with one another, enjoy the things that he has made, but most of all, we get to enjoy God fully. And we'll be able to say, as Job said, I will, there'll be a day that I will hear my Redeemer with my own ears, see my Redeemer with my own eyes, and walk beside him with my own.
Dienst.